mic. Sorry, I keep forgetting this. <laughs> okay, can, can I um, welcome you to the last in um, this term's series on populism and science, and to welcome you to the Oxford Martin School, um, which was founded by James Martin in 2005, uh, and is a wonderful multidisciplinary collection of 35 research units institutes which range across the disciplines from the hard sciences right the way across uh, to the arts and humanities. Um, this is a joint series on populism and science um, between the Oxford Martin School, it is their Trinity series, and the Oxford Institute of Population Aging, uh, which uh, was founded exactly 20 years ago this week. So in 1998, in uh, June, we got the um, go-ahead to uh, establish, um, having worked for a year with um, academics uh, across the university to establish a multidisciplinary institute uh, on population aging. And for those of you who've been loyally following us uh, across the series, um, I have said before that right from the very beginning we were doing um, public understanding of research or public engagement uh, with science before that term 20 years ago really existed. Um, that idea that it was really important that the, the, the scientist, the researcher had a reciprocal engagement with those worth working both in policy uh, and the general public. And a lot of the things that we work on around longevity or reproduction or migration, obviously we're taking evidence and it has huge policy implications, but it also increasingly uh, is concerned with uh, public debate. And we started this series on populism and science with uh, the Cabinet Office and Policy Lab talking about government and how government was trying to move uh, to include the public uh, as well as the provider of policy. Uh, we moved through um, to Fiona Fox from the Science Media Centre talking about the role of the journalist. We had the new scientist in the British Science Association. Uh, last week, uh, those of you who were here, we had wonderful talk from uh, Robin Nesbitt from Niblet from Chatham House talking about the role of government. Uh, and to round up this term, I'm delighted that we're going to move to the role of the museum in communicating science. Because one of the things that has been a constant theme across this series is that it's very easy to get the scientists nowadays. We have fantastic television programs, we have David Attenborough and Brian Cox, but it's still far more complicated to really understand the nuances of scientific debate and why it is that scientists are not black and white and why they change their minds and why one scientist may think this and another one may think that. And how do we as experts, we are experts, uh, within an increasing, um, questioning of expertise, and in a world where we have huge public experts, because of Google, everyone can be an expert, can go onto uh, the internet and find out lots of information, probably without having the knowledge. What is the role of the institution of the museum uh, in really helping people engage with and understand science? So we've got a panel. Um, and we're going to have three speakers who are going to speak for uh, roughly 10 minutes and then we're going to have a panel discussion uh, and then open it up. And I'm going to actually introduce all three of them at the beginning uh, and then they will seamlessly um, come in, into the panel and give their talk. So um, we're going to start um, with Dr. Alexander Sturgis who is director of the Ashmolean Museum um, here. Um, he was the director of the Hoban Museum in Bath before that uh, and also worked in the National Gallery in London and is an alumni of both University College and the Courtauld Institute of Art. And then we're going to go on to Professor Paul Smith, who is the director of the Oxford University Museum of Natural History and is our professor of natural history. Um, before um, uh, coming um, here, he was um, a geographer uh, in uh, the University of Birmingham doing, ge oh sorry, geologist, I do apologise, doing geological research on paleobiology, sedimentology and geochemistry. Um, so uh, great expertise in, um, in geology, clearly, which we haven't heard about geology yet, so um, that's um, something different. Um, and then we're going to move on to... Um, uh, Roger Highfield. Um, Roger Highfield is Director of External Affairs for the Science Museum Group, um, which the Science Museum is, is based in London, but there is um, other science museums in the country that are linked in. And before joining the, the um, National Museum of Science and Industry, which is the one in London, he was the editor of The New Scientist, and many of you will know that we, have a rec we had a recent editor, um, Emily Watson. It is Watson, isn't it? 
Emily Watson. Wilson, Emily Wilson. I knew it wasn't Watson. <laughs> Emily Wilson uh, talking, and, and, and Roger um, has also guided uh, the new scientist. Um, he's actually one of us uh, as well. He has an MA and DPhil in chemistry from the University of Oxford and has just been made a visiting professor at the Dunn School. So um, welcome to all three of you, very different perspectives. Um, and perhaps if I could invite you to come up first of all, um, and we will actually stay in the audience because we have some... PowerPoint. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Sarah, and it is a great pleasure to be here. Uh, and before I go any further, however, I think it is beholden on all of us uh, to congratulate Sarah Harper on her recent uh, um, being awarded of a CBE. So uh, many congratulations to you. <laughs> Um, having said that, I have to confess that when Sarah first invited me to be part of this um, debate, I wrote back saying, I think you've got the wrong person, and uh, where you should be going is to, uh, is to Paul Smith. She then said, I've already been to Paul Smith, um, and, I, uh, and I have not gone to the wrong person. Or uh, rather, I would like to hear about the perspective uh, of a museum of art and archaeology. And of course, the question immediately arises as to what does a Museum of Art and Archaeology have to do, or what can it do in terms of uh, explaining science? Um, and it is, of course, a question that simply would not have occurred to the founder of the Ashmolean Museum, Elias Ashmole, um, but, uh, who founded the museum in 1683, of course, and um, in a world long before C.P. Snow's Two Cultures, uh, in a world, uh, Ashwell was, of course, well, not of course, was a founding member of the Royal Society. He was a chemist, or was he an alchemist? He wrote on the antiquities of Berkshire and the order of the, uh, the history of the Order of the Garter. Uh, and the original Ashmolean, which is now houses uh, the Museum of the History of Science just over the road, was an institution built around the natural sciences. Um, and indeed, uh, its tripartite division on the three floors, there was the collection on the uh, top floor, uh, the, uh, the ground floor, was, or the Piano Nobile, was the school of natural sciences in which uh, teaching took place and in which the library was housed. And then there was a laboratory and anatomy school in the basement. And the whole was presided over by the university's first professor of chemistry. Uh, so this was an institution with huge ambitions, uh, I would say, in which it was hoped that with this combination of collection, uh, research, teaching, experiment, we would be able to understand the whole world and our place within it. Um, and the collection was a combination of the man-made and the artificial uh, and the natural. Uh, naturalia and artificialia. Um, and it was hoped, or it was expected, that through the, um, uh, by Ashmole, that through the study of this collection, knowledge would emerge. Um, of course, almost immediately, indeed before its foundation, this idea was being challenged by others in the university. Uh, the museum was being described as a Nick Nakatori. Uh, it was suggested that this random collection of strange objects could, of course, lead nowhere. And I think there are, um, to a degree, the history of the collections within uh, the university has not completely shaken off the idea that collections are Nick Nakatori's um, and knowledge cannot emerge from them. However, I would say if one considers that ambition, I think any museum would say that yes, collections, research, teaching, experiment should lead of museums of any kind to the knowledge of who we are and, uh, and where we exist in the world. But of course, the museum today is a very different thing from the, uh, from the natural history, uh, the curiosities there, a peach stone carved with uh, an image of the crucifixion and extraordinary objects such as Powhatan's mantle, unquestionably the most important um, Native American object 
um, from the period of first contact in the world. Um, we have recently redisplayed some of the founding collections in an attempt to give some sense both of the variety of material contained within it, so in, uh, reintroducing natural history um, and other aspects of the collection into the display, but also I hope to give some sense of the ambition of that initial uh, uh, institution uh, and uh, the ambition of its aims, uh, which are, as I say, aims that I think we might still hold. Uh, but what place, if any, does science hold in, uh, within those ambitions? Where does science sit in a museum devoted to archaeology and art history? Um, well, in some ways, the most interesting discussions that one has in the museum about collections are those that engage with scientists. Um, and of course, since 1955 and the uh, creation of the research lab for archaeology and art history within the university, the importance of uh, material science into understanding what the collections actually are is unquestionably fantastically important. And if one thinks about research into the collections, they are now, uh, there is no research into collections that can really take place without scientific examination of the objects or the works of art. Uh, being considered. This one very recent, but uh, oh, one recent but example of very many is uh, an extraordinary lustreware dish from 13th century Iran, which seemed to be pieced together from maybe what, more than one dish from 13th century Iran. And on uh, examination uh, of it uh, uh, materially, it has transpired that half of this dish is actually a early, uh, late 19th or early 20th century re, uh, uh, invention. And this is, we simply didn't know until then that this was possible. Uh, we knew that people pieced uh, these dishes together from uh, different fragments they had found, but we, were, uh, but we didn't know that there, uh, there was a technical capability to actually recreate 13th century lustreware um, in the early 20th century. Uh, so uh, that is one example of many. Uh, but scientific methods are also being used within the field of archaeology and art history in new and exciting and revealing ways. The imp uh, so again, just one example, but the use of big data and, the, and being able to explore it in different ways um, through uh, uh, open access uh, databases is being used, for example, in our coin hoards of the Roman Empire project, which is exploring 11,000 coin, uh, 11,000 hoards, and uh, the ambition is 3 million coins spread across Europe from which all sorts of different patterns will and are already, but will inevitably emerge. Um, and communicating this uh, these different elements of what we do is obviously important. We have a conservation gallery, which when it opened in 2009 was, I think, the first conservation gallery in any museum in which we explained what went on in the scientific exploration of things. Um, but of course, there are other, and I think more interesting ways, perhaps, of bringing science and scientific thinking into museums. And just to suggest or uh, uh, a few of those ways which, uh, with which we have been engaged. One of them is what we call thinking with things. Um, and this was a deliberate attempt to engage thinkers from across the university in uh, the museum's uh, collections. And in, uh, Sarah contributed, but so too did a number of other scientists and um, people from all, uh, all kinds of different disciplines. Uh, Susan uh, Jeb, second from the left, is a nutrition scientist. Uh, Alison Woolard here is a, a geneticist from the Department of Biochemistry. And what we asked each of these individuals to do was act, or what we did or attempted to do was essentially relinquish our curatorial control of how we expected these collections to be described and ask different people to look at them from their own areas of expertise um, and to open up 
one hopes in doing so, uh, the fact that these collections can be approached in all kinds of different ways to reveal or shed light on or, be, or suggest thinking about all kinds of different areas. Um, and I think that relinquishing of cur curatorial control to others from other disciplines is, um, is a way of opening up whole different fields of study, making people pause around that in, uh, and think about the institutional narrative that we inevitably uh, apply to our collections and recognize that actually any of the objects within the museum can be thought about uh, in, uh, from all kinds of different perspectives, which I hope and believe is a useful thing to do. Um, and there are, of course, other important ways, I think, in which science, uh, uh, we can work with scientists to very different ends. And one of them uh, we have, as I hope many of you know, these evenings, uh, live Fridays and other events, in which, again, we invite people from different disciplines into the museum. This, by the way, is a dancing physicist. Um, and in some ways, what I hope this does is suggest that scientific thinking itself is not entirely foreign to what goes on within museums, that there is a creative, artistic uh, element to almost all scientific thinking, that there is an open-endedness to it, that it is less... Uh, so the idea that these two worlds, uh, as uh, C.P. Snow's two cultures, think entirely differently is actually entirely wrong and that one needs to uh, bring the two together to the mutual benefit, I trust, of both. Uh, so uh, at the same time as redisplaying the founding collections uh, in the lower ground floor, we freed up a gallery alongside it, which we are calling internally at least, we're still debating whether to call it externally, the laboratory, with the idea that this is a space echoing the laboratory in the basement of the original Ashmolean, in which we should be inviting different types of thinkers, different types of thinking into the museum to uh, think about our collections from those, uh, those different angles. And there is one other way in which I think museums, um, there are many other ways, but another interesting way which we uh, have already started exploring, that museums and scientists can work, and that is to stop focusing on the collections, but to focus rather on those in the museum, uh, to think about how we uh, react to, respond to uh, both individual works of art and the museum and the institution as a whole, to actually become a laboratory, become an experiment. Um, and uh, so, again, we've work, been working with neuroscientists and psychologists, uh, and museums generally have been working with health professionals to produce evidence about the benefits uh, of um, encounters in museums. So that's it from me. Thanks, Zah. My own museum, the, the Museum of Natural History, of course, grows out of the Ashmolean. Um, and the collections, many of our collections, or some of our collections, start uh, as component parts uh, of, of the Ashmolean when it opened in 1683. Uh, as has been discussed both in the introduction and, and earlier in this series, uh, we live in an era of, of post-truth, of alternative facts. And, and that means it's never been more important for scientists to engage in active debates about what they do. Um, we can't hide in laboratories any longer. We need to get out there, and we need to get out there effectively. And, and that's not just in relation to talking about our science, it's in relation to the policy issues that underlie that science. Because the past 30 years, perhaps a little bit longer, is littered with examples at, at all scales of Instances where practitioners have really failed to engage, partly with stakeholders, with government, with uh, other agencies, but also, really importantly, with the public. And where, in consequence, they've let other media 
uh, or some media uh, take control and they've essentially lost the capacity to argue. And we could all think of examples, I'm sure. Um, aspects of climate change, rapid polar melting, a uh, subject close to my own heart, GM crops, classically, and, and as was covered earlier in the series, um, fracking and shale gas, uh, a, a current example, uh, tuberculosis control in cattle, all examples where we have really failed to engage, um, and at least failed to effectively engage. Now, I believe that museums and similar institutions, science centres, have a really important role in acting as, as brokers in that dialogue. Um, we've just, in the Museum of Natural History, reformulated uh, our strategic plan, and, and many aspects of the, we've given ourselves five challenges, and many aspects of those challenges you would see in any museum strategic plan, but two of them are really core to what we want to do over the next few years. Uh, one of those is, is how can we aid the, the generation of a, a new cohort of, of scientists, and importantly, um, a cohort of diverse young scientists. And I, I think museums have a role there, but in the context of, of tonight, one of our key challenges is, what can we do to, to act as that broker, to enable the public, our publics, to make evidence-led decisions, <coughs> excuse me, about really important aspects of, of policy around science, but more broadly as well. And I actually think that museums are one of the very few institutional types that can make a real difference. Um, other types of engagement can work, but it's in museums where we can get a genuine two-way dialogue with our audiences. The printed media can have their problems, and, and we'll hear a bit about that in a moment for, from Roger. Um, but there was a, a lovely study by, by Rusi Jaspel and Bridget Nerlik from Nottingham um, a couple of years ago in the Public Understanding of Science Journal. Um, and they looked at media coverage of the current shale gas debate. And they used text analysis to just look at how individual newspapers were shaping the agenda. And what they found was perhaps intuitive, but nonetheless it was uh, useful to have it documented. They found that in The Guardian and The Independent, the keywords were around Gasland, the famous film where if you turn on the tap, you can set fire to the water that comes out of it because of, uh, of leakage uh, of methane into groundwater. Uh, water and land contamination figured highly in, in terms of keyword searches, climate change, seismic risk, health risk, all negatives we must not frack. If you went to The Telegraph of the Times, then it, gas shale extraction was potentially a solution to climate change, a breathing space for air whilst we develop new energy technologies, um, a bridging fuel, importance in UK energy balance for the national good uh, for energy security. So, in other words, you can't go to any one of these newspapers and get a balanced story. It's strongly led by the editorial agenda. And if we go to broadcast media, such as the BBC. Firstly, they're principally in what, in, in public engagement terms, we would call transmit mode, literally, in the case of broadcasters. There's, there's very little, increasingly, an increasing amount, but still very little in terms of the consult stage of public engagement or the collaborate uh, stage. And, and the BBC, of, of course, has its own issues, well publicised around uh, balance and how it, it best represents uh, a balanced approach. But museums have moved really far beyond that transmit mode in, in recent years. Um, they're very active spaces where the public are engaged in consultation, in debate, uh, and in collaboration. They, they take different approaches. No, there's no one-size-fits-all for, for museums. Um, if one takes uh, Manchester Museum, with whom we work very closely, they've taken a really active campaigning strategy. They will go out and actively campaign uh, against climate change. If uh, one goes to the, the new uh, spectacular uh, Museo de la Magna in Rio de Janeiro, if ever you're in Rio, go. It's a spectacular building, but a really interesting approach because what they do is take an entirely data-led approach. They don't overlay uh, a, a campaigning agenda. They let the data speak for themselves. But as is common in other Brazilian museums, they do so with a, a power of emotion 
uh, that, that renders people to tears by the time they've, they've come out. It's, they just pump, pump, pump. Uh, facts on large video screens, and it, it's immensely moving, but entirely uh, data-led. And, and of course, being uh, taking that sort of approach, they can respond really quickly. We were, they, it's been open one year, and we visited last autumn, um, and we asked them, you know, how many times do we refresh their displays? They'd had 500 substantial updates in the first year. You know, so that's reacting in real, light, in real time uh, to, to, to news events. Um, the Science Lab Dublin, um, and shortly, of course, London, Melbourne, Bangalore, um, just about everywhere else on the globe, uh, favours a very contemporary arts-led approach. And no one of those approaches is right or wrong. They're, they're just different styles. Um, and we take elements from all of them, but particularly the last two, I would say. And what we did a few years ago was we, we launched a, a series called Contemporary Science and Society, um, and what we wanted to do was, was look at how we might harness the really unique research power of Oxford in combination with the very large numbers of visitors that come through the doors of the museum. So collectively, the GLAM institutions have 3.2 million visitors a year. That's the size of a, a good-sized national museum in the UK, and, and is way out in excess of, of uh, any other group of, of university museums. So we've got that research power and we've got those audiences. Can we link to them together using uh, the, the teams of really highly skilled public engagement staff that we have, uh, both within the divisions, but in, in research services, uh, and within GLAM itself? And we started in, in a low-key way with a little experiment called Biosense, uh, written by Georgina Ferry, uh, who's here in the audience, uh, that, wanted, that looked at biological sensing. We took different bits of research from uh, across the divisions, actually from five academic departments in the end. Um, and we looked at the ways that, that organisms use biological sensing, particularly around how do they sense oxygen in the environment, how do they sense light, how do bacteria know where they are in time and space. But actually underpinning all of that was that these were all bits of research that were really powered uh, by the search for new drugs, um, by cancer therapies, uh, by uh, heart therapy, by um, jet lag therapies. We looked at geological mapping and seismic risk in the Himalayas around the, the Nepalese earthquakes, uh, and at neuroscience frontiers. And I, I'll just unpick that, that last uh, exhibition called, called Brain Diaries. Uh, we put it up in the Upper East Gallery. We wanted to engage people with aspects of neuroscience that they might not know about, even for, from reading uh, current printed media. So we really pulled together the research. In fact, by the time we finished, we pu pulled together uh, research from across four academic departments, 50 individual researchers. And it was up there for, for eight months. Um, and in that time, we reached 168,000 visitors. So a, a substantial footfall. But of course, you can't measure things just in, ter in terms of footfall. What we increasingly want to do as we gain confidence in these exhibitions is that it's not just about the exhibition. It's at least as much about the programming that we wrap around it. The, the symposia, the science fairs, the sidebars, the school lab tours, the talks, the facilitated tours, the music, the film screening, the dance, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and by the end of Brain Diaries, we, we managed to squeeze in over 40 uh, such events, which brought in a group of people who incidentally saw the exhibition as well. We, we wanted it to have a, a a citizen science aspect. So there was a, a big science competition at the end of the exhibition where people could pop into a giant 3D printed brain, uh, a suggestion for a neuroscience experiment that we guaranteed would be carried out. The, the winner uh, would have the, the experiment carried out. And in fact, actual fact, we had a, a children's category and an adult's category. We had over 900 entries to that, that competition. And that research is, is now being undertaken. The, we evaluated it throughout because it wasn't just about footfall. We wanted to, to make sure that we were making a difference. And the, the, post, the pre and post visit evaluation showed that there was a positive change in understanding. Uh, people were documenting the fact that they knew more about brain changes through the life cycle and one particular quirk of the exhibition that uh, changes uh, in, in brain wiring during teenage years make a, a significant difference to teenage behavior uh, was, was one that, that really echoed with the audiences. 
So that was successful and we built on that with, with settlers, all of these exhibitions. We want to be very interdisciplinary as well as drawing from it across uh, the university. We recognize though that not everyone is going to come to a science exhibition in a science museum or a natural history museum. Um, and so we're also experimenting to loop back into what Zar was saying, uh, at, at trying to bridge the two cultures. I've never really believed the two cultures argument. Um, but if we can actually hook that contemporary art audience and, and interleave it with science, then we can um, draw in new audiences. And we had an experiment uh, a couple of years ago uh, called Visions of Nature, picking up on the pre-Raphaelite theme that uh, reflects the architecture of the museum. And we had, again, an, an interleaved program of, of poets in residence, three poets in residence riffing off each other, um, a visual art exhibition around paintings and sculpture of Kurt Jackson called Bees and the Old Wasp in My Bonnet. Um, that brought in uh, the evaluation, showed an audience that was coming specifically for that exhibition. But in between, we interleaved uh, the science around the diversity of bees, uh, around the, the ecology of bee decline, the fact that the, the reasons for bee declining honeybees is different to, to that in bumblebees. Um, and then, in a way, the, the most successful aspect that you might have seen in the museum cafe was a, an exhibition called Microsculpture that um, is perhaps our most successful temporary exhibition to date. It attracted a huge footfall. The exhibition videos had 10 million views um, on the web so far. It's now toured to seven locations in five countries. Um, but it, it brought in that audience, and it actually began to raise research questions in its own right. The, there were aspects of the functional morphology of insects that we knew nothing about. So to conclude, whatever the mode of engagement, um, the challenge is, is to build science confidence, what, what we technically call science capital, to engage in a, a two-way exchange. Um, and if we do that effectively, then at the end of the day, people will feel confident in making evidence-informed decisions uh, about policy and about science in general, but they'll be supportive of science. Thanks very much. Well, it's great to be back here, actually. Sarah and I both did student journalism in the early 80s in Oxford, how we got going. So it's sort of, uh, yes, anyway, sorry to, for that depressing uh, retro uh, uh, thing. Anyway, um, I, I agree with everything that, uh, that Zan and Paul have, have said, and I suppose I'm just going to try and make a few extra points. Uh, in, uh, although one thing they, they both said about science and arts both being part of culture, the thing that constantly drives me bonkers is when people don't really think of the science museum as a cultural institution. And I would, just to be provocative, say that science being put to work through technology is the greatest force of modern culture. So that seems to me completely um, bizarre. Um, so we've heard a lot about some of the roles that museums uh, play, and obviously we curate information. And the thing that we do with five and a half million visitors across the group that maybe people don't appreciate is we do a lot of audience research. So when people talk about this, this amorphous blob called the public, it's actually very complicated. We segment these audiences. We have eight different audiences, um, and we think about their behaviors. And so um, there's very sophisticated engagement or there's an attempt at sophisticated engagement with audiences, and it often surprises me when people talk about public engagement, they never really start to talk about segmentation and audiences, and if you don't talk about that, then it's not really, um, it's not really a real conversation about engagement. Um, in terms of specifics across the group, we've actually done quite a lot on the post-truth uh, agenda. Um, one of our museums is the National Science and Media Museum uh, in Bradford, um, we did a quick turnaround exhibition on post-truth uh, curated by John O'Shea with events with people like Samira Ahmed, um, where we looked at, um, you know, we've got enormous photographic collections, the Daily Herald archive and so on. Um, so we've got things like the Cottingley Fairies uh, taken in 1917. Um, we, we, you know, there's loads of examples of photo manipulation, headline manipulation and so on. And interestingly, we had a post-truth discussion at our museum in Manchester. That's the Museum of Science and Industry as part of the Museums Association. And we had a third post-truth 
discussion in London, moderated by Fiona Fox, which as you can hear on the Science Museum blog, and we brought together for the first time the three post-truth authors, so Evan Davis, uh, Matt Dancona, who's one of our trustees, and also Jamie Ball of BuzzFeed. Um, and we had a great discussion, and actually it did come to a similar and complementary conclusion to the discussions in Bradford, which is there's nothing really new about the post-truth phenomenon, but it's sort of been weaponized by the internet. And perhaps, you know, the most dramatic example that I've come across just recently was at an AI symposium in New York, where I had a member of a big, it was all a Chatham House rules, but a, a, a major player talked about GANs, these are generative adversarial networks, and showed how you can give a GAN now um, 2,000 celebrities and you can make fake celebrity images. They're rather eerie. You look at them and you think, oh, I recognize that person, but actually it's completely fake. You can give a GAN a, head, uh, a caption and a GAN will generate an image to go with a caption. And then the other thing they were talking about was this uh, slightly grim uh, use of software to morph celebrity faces onto pornography and so on. And suddenly we're just through you know, artificial imagination, if you like, entering a whole new era of image manipulation, which is going to confuse people uh, even more. Um, so, uh, as Sarah mentioned, you know, I'm a, I'm a hack by background. And again, one thing that I find interesting in the discussion about engaging with audiences is that um, it's easy to be arcane and get a tiny audience, or let's say smart and get a tiny audience. Um, it's easy to be dumb and popular, but obviously what we really want to be is smart and popular. And even that's not quite straightforward, and I just wanted to kind of throw one example at you, something that still makes me scratch my head. I've got to say I'm not a fan of the Daily Mail. Uh, I've got respect for Dacre as a journalist and what he, what, what he and his amazing ability to tap into Middle England. But let me give an example of something that interested me when the Dolly the Sheep story broke. The mail splashed with uh, a story that said, can they raise the dead? Question mark. Now, we all know there's just a two-letter story to be written there, but they actually wrote about a thousand words. And they kind of unpacked this ludicrous claim that f cloning could be used almost like to photocopy someone, you know, from a cell as they were dying. And then they, you had cloning experts coming in and say, well, actually, hang on a moment. You'd have to grow them in identical conditions. You'd have to wait all this time. And actually, I thought it was quite interesting that for the Daily Mail readers, and there were probably about two million, I don't know how many are left now, but there were probably twice the readership back then in the 90s that there are now, if they'd got to the end of that story, they actually would have had quite an interesting nuanced view of what cloning was really about. So it starts off with a provocation, and actually it does end up airing a debate. And I remember meeting Michael Crichton uh, at, a, at a big uh, meeting, who was endlessly being snipped at about, you know, DNA does, it wouldn't have survived in amber, and Jurassic Park was all, but, you know, the Jurassic franchise is lumbering on, and it triggered a big conversation about genetic technologies and so on. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? They are. Just to be annoying, I'll leave you with that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, with um, three diverse but actually very linked um, views. So, I mean, one, one thing I think that came out, and actually, Roger, right at the end, you referred to it, that there's some really fantastic uh, skilled work which is using arts and which is uh, involving scientists. Um, and uh, as you said, I, I was involved in those voices at the Ashmolean, which was the most amazing uh, you know, experience as a researcher. Um, but on the other hand, we then contrast that with Dolly the Sheep and the fact that there are millions of people who read the Daily Mail. Although, Paul, one thing I wanted to bring you up on, you said just suddenly, because I'm writing down digital, online, Google, that you had 10 million views 
So presumably all of you are increasingly moving onto the internet and taking the museum out onto the internet. Mm. And, and do you have to behave differently? Do you have to, how, how, how do you do that? How do you transcend that? Um, I think it, it's natural that we, we want to, to use the capacity of the internet to get out there because although you know, the footfalls, as I mentioned, into glam institutions are high, they're small in comparison with the audiences that we can reach if we use digital platforms. And, and I think what we try and do um, is, is carry through the same personality that the museum has um, if, if you visit physically. Um, and each of the museums has a very different personality. For us, it, it's about being serious about research, but being quite playful <coughs> at, at the same time. I, I do think the internet is a big challenge for museums because uh, we're so focused on our buildings and our collections that the great potential benefits of the internet are, of, of course, linking our connection, uh, collections elsewhere. So I think there is a world which we're not in yet, although the, the coin hoards of the Roman Empire was uh, a case where we are, which is all about open link data and essentially is not, although it uh, centres at the Ashmolean, it's not about the Ashmolean collection, it's about the collections of the world. And, and I think uh, there is, yes, yeah, so, uh, that the great benefits of the internet are actually those that are, to some extent, denied a physical museum. Um, I mean, from our point of view, yes. we, we were the most Googled, the Science Museum, this is the most Googled museum on the planet a few years ago, and um, when we asked Google how did they know, they just said we know, and we couldn't actually get them to reveal their workings, but it's an interesting <laughs> fact, so we're very interested in this. We've also got a big 50 million project to move and digitise something of the order of 300,000 um, objects. Um, but for, and there's, it's like a factory scale operation. But for me, the missing bit in the discussion is narratives, because um, just plonking the image of something with the usual kind of desiccated curatorial description and a few, a bit of, you know, little scrap of metadata, no one's going to graze through this stuff. So you have to think about stories that knit together. You know, we've got some amazing objects like Stevenson's rocket or Tim Peake's spacecraft or whatever. They tell a remarkable story. What's really hard is if you've got 300,000 things online, what makes people graze through this stuff? How can you create narrative paths through them? And actually, I, I don't think anyone's really, you know, that's not an easy problem to create. That, that's, no, been, but, that's been an interesting problem in the US, actually, where there's been a, a large uh, NSF program to unite natural history collections. And they've now got 110 million natural history objects online. No one's using it. No one knows how to navigate it. There are no narratives to guide yeah. people through it. But in some ways, is that the responsibility of the museum? I mean, in some ways, our responsibility is to put it out there. Yeah. Uh, of course, there is another responsibility, which is around you know, uh, the narratives. But equally, we shouldn't feel that we need to control those narratives. I think that one of the excitements of bringing different types of thinking into museums is that um, if you can do that on a sort of global scale, one could rearrange collections in excitement if everyone had open access uh, uh, data of their collections, that that could be curated by others for different purposes. And who are these others? You could do public history exercise, although there's a bit of tension with curators, because they sort of, I mean, certainly in our railway museum in York, there's an amazing group of rail enthusiasts who actually know more and a curatorial, you know, about very arcane things like, you know, sigling in Shildon in, you know, 18 something or other, and there's the guy who knows everything about it. Um, so it can be really, really useful. And also, um, we, for example, we had the last working exchange in London, the Enfield Exchange. We took it back to Enfield to get to an advertise with people to tell us how they worked on it. It's very interesting. You can have the manual that says this is how you should use a bit of technology, but whether people actually <laughs> used it that way. So you can, you can build things that way as well. Be, 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 because in a way, I mean, I think everything that you've said has been fantastic, but in a way, we're still talking to this bubble of people who are actually already engaged mm. and are interested. And, and, yeah. and when I was at the RI, we had all, a huge number of followers in the States, and they were all complete nerds who just wanted. Mm. And every time we put a new object up and we tweeted it, and, and, and that's why they loved us. Mm. And they didn't care about the story or the context. They just liked the idea of some weird object that we had put online. Um, and, 
And this idea that, I mean, so, so maybe museums really need to be these 3D interactive virtual spaces that we go on, but why would we go on and why would, just by learning about these objects, so it is coming back to this, you know, I mean, it's fine to say the public will curate it, but how, how do we engage with the Daily Mail reader in museums if museums are really going to help us all understand science? I mean, I, th I think it's a really good question, and actually, you know, I, I phrase it as sort of different way in a, in a curious way you know we've got the BBC for the radio four audiences but we really we do want the prime time BBC one audiences and trying to think mm -hmm. of ways to do that I mean we try to start early so we we have our interactive gallery where we work with schools across London and we're building that audience from about a hundred thousand children to two hundred thousand a year and that is using this ghastly uh, museum speak BAME black Asian minority ethnic you know, whereas um, people who walk through the front door of the museum is about one-fifth BAME, um, for that group of children, we're reaching 46% BAME. So that's very, it's a very significant group. And I think, you know, it's actually catching them young, particularly in disadvantaged communities, mm -hmm. can help break this down. But this is a long-term endeavour, yes. obviously. Let, let, let's open it up um, for some questions from the audience. Stunned them into silence. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, and, and sorry, and I should have said we're actually streaming and filming the questions. So if you don't want to be streamed, please don't ask a question because we can't edit you out. So I hope you still want to ask it. <laughs> Just coming back to the example from uh, South America, I think, wasn't it? Uh, where the audience at uh, the, the museum is being quite brave and saying, this is just a platform and we're able to respond to different public ideas, what's next after that? And thinking about, um, I guess, Facebook saying it is a platform, it doesn't have editorial control over what it has, and you're uh, worried, Roger, about kind of crafting the narrative between all these different objects, and what's the use of these millions of different objects unless there's a strand between 12 of them that's just fascinating. Mm -hmm. If you start giving away editorial control to uh, members of the public, which I think is great, um, what's next in the museum landscape. As, and an alternative might be giving editorial control over to certain groups, um, sort of, I don't know, a group, uh, a group of BAME, uh, people in, working in partnership with the museum to put together a strand of work that's uh, open to people who aren't from that community to help audience porosity between different segments of the society. Well, well, that's, it's not next, that's now. I mean, so the idea of, I mean, I'm talking, and I must be careful to stick to science, but talking uh, uh, within museums, uh, the community curation and bringing, um, being sure that in the same way as research is being uh, sort of challenged to engage with the public in the process of research, so to museums are already and are increasingly bringing audiences they wish to reach in at a very early stage in the developing of ideas about how they're going to present their collections or, or, or their information and bring other voices into the museum. So I think um, there are, uh, it is about uh, relinquishing curatorial control to a degree, but yet in terms of art and archaeology, we do have a responsibility to the, to the objects, that they're not simply telling lies about what these things are. And I think um, the same will unquestionably be true in science museums. So, you know, there's a responsibility, but maybe more to, you know, the yeah. facts. It's tricky. And I mean, also, what facts are you presenting? I mean, I, I, could, I wish I could remember the name of the museum. There's a museum in New York which did a kind of um, modern art installation. It looked like a lot of bits of crumpled car and an art collective reinterpreted it as a battle between the Autobots and Decepticons. They gave a kind of a Transformers narrative and actually it was incredibly funny, I thought, but I'm a, I'm a Philistine, of course. <laughs> but to give an example that would worry me, you could um, talk about the evidence for climate change, but then uh, I, I guarantee if you have public curation, you'd end up with uh, warmists and deniers curating their own narrative paths through this. So is that a good thing or a, or a bad thing? I don't know, it's, it would be interesting. I think you'd have to leave it to people to decide, but 
you'd have to accept that there will be narratives that, that the consensus wouldn't be very happy with, I think. And in the same way that you know, once upon a time museums were all about the museum curator standing and saying this was the fact, this was the truth, um, it's, it's not a matter of, of just leaving it to be a free-for-all with the public. It, it, what community curation does, and we used it in, in Brain Diaries extensively for the first time, so we got our youth forum in uh, to ask them, in an exhibition of this type, what would they particularly like to see? And it, what it does is enable a dialogue to build up so that you can have an in-depth conversation that, that isn't possible just with us telling people what the facts are or they're they telling us what they want to, to hear. This, uh, to, to a certain extent, this goes back to the seminar we had on framing. Um, and I was very struck um, when you were talking about the Brazilian Museum and, and the way that they used emotion um, because that's exactly what Nikki Hawkins was talking about. And, and in a way, maybe being sort of brave in the way that scientists would go, no, you shouldn't be doing this, but she was talking uh, about, in, in this particular case, it was about crime and trying to understand what did people want mm -hmm. and then telling the story in that way, even though maybe that wasn't the evidential base, but it then got people engaged and from mm -hmm. then you could help them understand. And, and I just thought of a, a fantastic exhibition I went to in the New Zealand Museum of Modern Art in Auckland. And it was an art installation. And what they had done was to take Chrysler and relate it to the pyramids and basically say that, that in the same way that the pyramids define Egypt, that Chrysler defines the United States. And from that, using all sorts of digital material, one really, I mean, you learned a huge amount about the economics of 20th century America. It was very, very clever, but it was an art installation. And, and I, th I think something like that, that, that in a way what we're saying is maybe rather than, if you like, crowdsourcing what we should be understanding, maybe we should be, or me, you who control that link between the sort of evidence in the public via the museum world, should almost be framing it mm. in different yeah. ways. And, and so there's more responsibility to frame in alternative ways rather than allowing the public to come in and decide. Yes, I think against, or not against the argument of uh, community curation, but the other, the counter mm. sort of uh, view might be precisely that, around a more confidence in our theatricality, mm. if you like. And, and I think engaging the emotions is unquestionably what museums should be doing. And, and the ways of doing that are often, you know, Hollywood or... Uh, yes all uh, sort of dubious in some way. Um, and I think that in itself is quite interesting, that the idea that one's emotions are engaged, one feels immediately that they're being manipulated. Mm -hmm. um, but that's not always the case. And I think there's a degree to which we're, we're, we're trapped within a sort of Anglo-Saxon paradigm of a museum, and maybe a Western European one. Uh, and and Brazil, in Brazil, museums of virtually any type are free of that, and, and they are... Uh, places of, of, of memory and, and places of powerful emotion. Uh, and I, I think we can learn from that. We have some other questions. David. George, sorry. Uh, it's George Smith from the Materials Department at the University. Um, a couple of things. First of all, in terms of the science arts uh, alleged divide, I think one of the uh, things worth pointing out is the question of aesthetics. Uh, that when scientists are looking, for example, at theories and comparing different theories, sometimes very difficult things to test, like with elementary particles, then the, the intuitive judgment that is applied on different models is, in many cases, boils down to an aesthetic model. If it's elegant uh, and simple and clean, uh, then we love it. If it's clunky and got rough edges, we don't like it. And you end up with things of incredible beauty, like uh, Einstein's equation E equals MC squared, or the Schrodinger equation, or the infinite series for the base of natural logarithms. And one's actually making an aesthetic judgment as much as anything else. So that, that's, that's one point. Um, the other point, in terms of the role of museums and others, um, there's a very good quote from uh, a former president of the Royal Society, Michael Atia, uh, And this was in terms of a discussion about what role the Royal Society could or should play, for example, with the genetic, uh, the GM debate. And the phrase he used was that there was an opportunity to hold the ring for debate. Um, and of course, this happened in Oxford in the 19th century with the debate between Darwin and uh, the bishops. 
uh, but the, 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 the opportunity to uh, allow uh, each side to set out their arguments and to, for them to be lis listened to calmly and rationally is, is a huge opportunity. Um, the, the, f the final point I would make, but closer to home, um, the, the uh, bread and butter, if you like, a lot of this, involves the curation of science. One has to preserve what's there. And certainly I, I would be profoundly, uh, as I speak, I have a history graduate working in my former lab, producing an electronic archive of the work that uh, we had done. Uh, and for example, uh, for the, the Royal Society wants to, to archive this kind of material, for a publication, the view they've taken is the final paper that appears in the journal is a tip of an iceberg. If you reverse engineer, uh, it may, there's been a peer review process, uh, it may be revised. Very commonly we will have articles that have gone through 20 drafts before they finally appear. Uh, and in understanding how scientists work, one needs to understand how these things have uh, mm -hmm. evolved. Mm -hmm. And the concern in Oxford particularly is that I can't see any systematic curatorial effort for 20th century science. We've got wonderful resources for 17th, 18th and 19th. Science has exploded in the 20th century and there's nothing systematic being done to curate it. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. Uh, I'd be interested in comments on all these three. Yes. <laughs> oh, gosh. I mean, I, mean, I mean, sadly, we are actually running out of time, so maybe just some reflections and maybe taking on board what George has also said. Yeah, raised. I mean, symmetry and beauty. I, I think now the more, exo you know, the more theoretical end of physics, with the lack of experimental data, the lack of ability to prove anything, we seem to be resting more on aesthetics. So I agree with you there. Royal Society holding the ring. Uh, I still find it staggering. I can remember the time when research councils and the Royal Society wouldn't, so wouldn't in, get involved in... Uh, talking about the need to do animal experimentation and vivisection. It was only poor old Colin Blakemore who put his head mm -hmm. above the parapet. So I think it's really important that people like the Royal Society do get uh, involved. And um, I should say, George, I remember your um, microscopy. I think they had a certain aesthetic appeal, the images coming mm -hmm. out of your, uh, you know, your, your kit in the materials department. So there we are. So, uh, well, just as a reflection, I would say, I do think museum. I mean, of course, I work in museums, so I think they are unique organisations, but I think what is remarkable about them within the sort of uh, our broader culture is that I think they do remain, for the most part, trusted organisations. Uh, and, and that trust mm. is something that's clearly yes. precious mm. to maintain, but also, when it comes to these kind of debates, places us potentially in a, in a really strong position in engaging the public without um, uh, engaging the public with a real debate and with real ideas mm -hmm. in ways that, as we've all discussed, is maybe difficult elsewhere. Mm -hmm. And to reflect on your second point, you're absolutely right that the Museum of Natural History was born as a place of debate. It was the opening event of the museum. Uh, and we very much want to return it to there. And that's why, um, as I mentioned um, in my introduction, that you know, the exhibition is only the starting point. It's what we wrap around it in terms of, of the dialogue and the events and the debates that are, are really important because it, it's, it's that two-way exchange that will make the difference. Thank you very much for a, a, a wonderful sort of um, spectrum of ideas coming out of our museums and also the fact that there is obviously a, a lot of work that needs to be done and that you can do. Uh, be, before we, we thank our panel, um, th this is term sub series obviously finishes um, today, but we have four um, lectures in Michaelmas term, um, which will start uh, at the end of October. Um, so we have Claire Craig from the Policy Unit of the Royal Society. Um, Imran Khan from the Wellcome Trust. We hope we're getting Jennifer um, Rubin, who's the new um, the head of ESRC. And then we're going to finish at the end of November with Patrick Balance, who's the government's chief um, scientific office uh, advisor. Um, very much taking a lot of the ideas we've been discussing this term, but looking at the role of those specific four institutions. Obviously, the research council is being reflect, um, represented by the ESRC. So hopefully, we will see uh, many of you there. But can we thank? our panellists um, for rounding up this term's seminar series. Thank you.